Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. You know, the new year has arrived, and for a lot of us, that means that we're rethinking what we would like to do in the new year. And one of the things that unfortunately happens is that sometimes one partner decides that they're done with the marriage. January is the time that divorce attorneys' phones and marriage counselors' phones ring off the hook. And hopefully you're one of the lucky ones who has not been told by their spouse that they want a divorce. But that doesn't mean that you are out of the woods when it comes to your marriage. There are some very specific things that if you do, you're never going to have to worry about, is my, does my partner want a divorce? Is my marriage safe? Are we okay? And so today's show is going to be a little bit different than what I usually do in the fact that I do not have a guest. But what I am going to be doing is I am going to be talking about the kinds of things that there are 10 very basic things that you can do to improve your relationship. Because if you've been a listener to the show, you know that I do not use the word miserable and marriage in the same sentence. I don't think that people should be staying married because divorce scares them or staying married because who wants to date again? I think people should stay married because they want to, because they enjoy their partner, because they enjoy the family and the circumstance that marriage has created for them. And so this is what I'm talking about today. So the first thing that I want to talk about is kindness. Because there's a saying that familiarity breeds contempt. And unfortunately, this is often the result in a marriage. And one way this shows up is how you actually treat each other. I have been... <laughs> I don't want to say surprised, but frequently appalled by the way that my clients will talk to each other. People will treat absolute, complete strangers, people that they'll never see again, with more kindness than they treat their spouse. And, you know, I get it. Being upset with your partner is going to happen. Your partner is going to disappoint you. You're going to disappoint them. They're going to annoy you. You're going to annoy them. Not a problem, right? But being unkind is a choice. Calling your partner names, sitting in judgment on their behavior, it's not a recipe for a successful, happy marriage. Because the truth of the matter is, relationships are reciprocal. How you make your partner feel is going to be reflected in their behavior back to you. And putting out positive behaviors towards your partner will more than likely result in goodwill coming back to you. So the biggest, the biggest relationship bang for the buck you can make is to be kind to your partner. Um, and uh, Lao Tse said that kindness in giving creates love. And it's also the opposite of contempt. One of John Gottman, who's a relationship guru, I've talked about him before on the show, one of his four horsemen of the marital apocalypse is contempt. Contempt involves name calling, personal insults, mockery, hostile humor, and disrespectful body language, such as eye roll. And if any of these behaviors are present in your marriage, a move towards kindness can reap huge rewards. Even if your marriage has been barred by negative, angry, or hurtful remarks, it can often be rescued by 
turning it around and filling your home with words and actions that elicit the positive emotions that I've been talking about. Now, kindness shouldn't be random. It should be intentional. So actually listening and looking at your partner when they're talking to you, saying please and thank you, the magic words that we all learned when we were in kindergarten. Um, if you're going and getting something from another room, if you're going to go get a glass of water from the kitchen or take something upstairs, asking your partner if there's anything that they would like. Doing a chore that's normally theirs is a kindness, right? Just being nice, and you know, it should not be a difficult thing to do. So that's the first one, is kindness. Now the second thing that you can do is to spend time together. Um, the thing is, is that you only can experience the first time once, right? So when you fall in love, you know, and it, it's like being high on drugs, and you know, familiarity and routine dim these natural drugs over time. And this can lead to a sense of monotony and disappointment to quote you, the Peggy Lee song, is that all there is? Um, and, but the good news is you can reignite those in love hormones, those neurotransmitters, the oxytocin, all of these things that um, got you attracted and connected to your partner in the first place. And one of those things you want to release is dopamine. It's linked to the brain's reward and pleasure centers, and dopamine is released when you do new and fun activities. And if you are doing new and fun activities with your spouse, you both get a dopamine hit, and you release the bonding hormone oxytocin. These are the kinds of things that, keeping, um, that, that keep you together. You know, going ahead and mixing up the routine in your life, doing new and fun things together, that allows you to fall in love all over again. Um, and sharing these positive experiences on a consistent basis is, um, is what I'm talking about. And so this is why that you, you know, any, any marriage professional, any relationship professional suggests a weekly date night. Now, date night does not have to be something that costs money. You don't even have to leave your home to do it. And my definition of date night is the two of you doing something together that is fun. Date night is not going to the same restaurant eating the same food and not and being on your phones. That is not a date night, right? Date night is not going someplace and hashing out what's going on in your relationship. That's not a date night. Date night is about doing something fun. Um, you can take a class together. You can cook dinner together. You can go out and get physical, go, go on a hike or kayaking. My husband and I have just started playing um, disc golf. So these are some things that you can do. Go new places. Take a couple's only vacation, which is really important. Um, all of these things that will help. And, but being together on a regular basis is going to serve to protect your marriage. Okay. The next thing that I recommend is to let go. Now, let go is a very, letting go is a very specific thing. Um, a colleague of mine, Terry Real, wrote in the New Rules of Marriage, he identifies five losing strategies that people engage in that hurts their marriages. And the first of these strategies is needing to be right. And an example of this is when you or your partner are presenting quote unquote objective evidence that supports your position. And usually what happens is the two of you just go back and forth about who's right. And if you're right, guess what that means? It means your partner has to be wrong or vice versa. And nobody likes being wrong. And in many cases, it isn't a case of somebody being 
factually right or wrong. It's more a matter of opinion, right? I happen to be cold all the time. And so my husband and I don't agree. You know, if we say, what's it like outside? He says, it's really nice. I'll go outside and I'll be freezing. It's 65 degrees outside. We can agree on that. But whether that's warm or cold is a matter of opinion. So instead of arguing about it, and couples will do this all the time, they'll argue about, you said this, no, I didn't, yes, you did. And I tell people, unless you have a tape recorder or a video camera, we do not remember things exactly. Our memories are not video cameras. And so getting involved in that and needing to be right is, is really destructive for your marriage. As, as Terry Real says, who's right, who's wrong, who cares? This is also the same idea about would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Now, there are some things that, yes, it's worth getting you know, the facts straight and, and coming up with a plan. But, you know, but again, this, I, this idea of being right is really going to take a toll on your relationship. Because again, as I said before, if you're right, your partner has to be wrong. And what you want in your marriage is a win for you, a win for your partner, and a win for your marriage. If any one of those things is losing, then your marriage is going to be losing. Um, and again, you don't have to agree with your partner. Agreeing with your partner, I mean, disagreement in, in any relationship is a given. But having to prove your point is not loving and it's not helpful to the marriage. So the next thing that I recommend is to be present, right? Um, Laura Vanderkam wrote a book many years ago called 168 Hours. And in it, she says, one of her favorite lines, one of my favorite lines from her book is, we tell people what our priorities are by how we spend our time. And one of the most common reasons why people go, come to see me, call me, or, or, my, or my colleagues, is when they describe their relationship as being more like roommates than spouses. They frequently describe their life as you know, living parallel existence with limited meaningful interaction, let alone any real intimacy. And you know, busy is the new badge of honor, right? We're, we're, we're so busy. We're busy with work, with taking care of the kids, with dealing with meals, laundry, chores, television, surfing the internet, anything, anything, right? As opposed to actually having a conversation with each other. And, you know, I get it. The squeaky wheel gets all the attention. And if things are okay in your marriage, you may not, you know, you may think that I have to go put out all of these other fires. But as I have said repeatedly, nothing thrives on neglect and your marriage is no different. It is critically important on a regular basis to be spending time with each other in in-depth conversation. Most of what people do is they talk to each other in 30 second to one minute burst, and it's what I call informational exchange. They never sit down and have real conversations that last for 20 to 30 minutes. Those are when you are really connecting with each other. And when you have those conversations, you want all electronics to be by the wayside, you want to actually be fully present and engaged with your partner, okay? Um, this is how we get to know ourselves. People think that they've been together for a long time. I mean, I've said this before. My husband and I have been together for 36 years. We still surprise each other with our thoughts, right? He was actually surprised to find out that I wanted to go play disc golf. We never would have had that conversation 
uh, you know, it, except that, you know, our son plays and that's how we got into it. But, but this is one of those things that when you tune in, when you connect with each other on a regular basis, you're continuing to feed all of that positivity and goodwill. Okay. And so talking about positivity, that is another simple thing that you can do, right, is to identify the positives in your relationship. This is critically, critically important because what we know is that gratitude, positivity, those kinds of things are associated with personal happiness. By the way, you can't make your partner happy. Your partner has to choose to be happy. But one of the ways that we can choose to be happy is to focus on what is going right in our relationships, to focus on the, the, the things, the positive things that our partner is, that your partner is bringing to your relationship. Um, negatives are very, very powerful. Negatives are what keep us alive. We need to know about the threats in our life. And so that's, that's the power of the negative. And it takes three to five positive interactions to balance out and overcome one negative one, depending on how, how awful that negative one was. So if you and your partner have a big fight, and you yell at each other and you call each other names, that's a huge negative. And so you're going to have to do five positive things to balance that out. We look for the negative. It's, way, it's the way human beings' brains are wired. That is not a bug of the system. It's actually a feature. It's what keeps us alive. But it's also what is going to destroy your relationship because when we only see the things that our partner is doing that annoy us, then we rewrite our own history. This is what I get when, when I hear from couples, well, we never, I was never in, I never loved this person. Let's go back to the wedding day and take a look at your pictures. Most of the time you did, you've just allowed the negative to take root. So that's, Half of the 10, I just want to remind you that this is Happily Ever After is just the beginning. I'm Leslie Dorries, and I'm talking today about ways that you can make your relationship better. And what I'm inviting you to do is to pick one of them. Start with one and get really consistent in that one. And if you're interested in learning how to do this and get really consistent you know, in your marriage and to protect your marriage, I'm happy to talk with you. Please give me a call or shoot me an email and schedule your free, no obligation, five-star relationship um, assessment strategy session. And we'll talk about what's going on. We'll talk about these 10 things and we'll talk about how to bring them into your life. So you can reach me by email, Leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com or you can send me, um, uh, or you can call me at area code 919-924-0463. Again, that's 919-924-0463. Now I want to get back to the final five. And so number six kind of goes along with number, with number five about focusing on the positive. And this is be appreciative. Three of the most important words for living a good life are please and thank you. We teach our kids those are the magic words, but they frequently disappear over the years of marriage. And, you know, again, managing the day-to-day -day responsibilities often takes priority over gratitude. I, I'm not going to lie. I expect my husband to come home every night, <laughs> right? I, I do, t I take that for granted, but I'm also very appreciative that he does. I'm very appreciative that he works very, very hard and has provided us with, with a, a, a good life. Um, we want to feel your, we want to feel like 
we matter. You want to feel like what you're doing is being seen and acknowledged, and your partner wants the same thing. Um, you know, you know, it's it's interesting because, like I said, it's very easy for us to take things for granted. And oh, by the way, one of these things about being appreciative or the opposite of it is having expectations and not letting your partner know about it. So you're holding them accountable for something that they don't know they're supposed to be doing as opposed to being appreciative or even, you know, they, they have agreed to do to meet your expectation and instead of being grateful and appreciative, it's like, well, that's what they're supposed to be doing. Yes, that may be true, but it's still really nice to be seen, to be heard, to be acknowledged. Um, you know, and, and so this was, you know, this, this is really, um, you know, some, so, and, and, and again, it doesn't necessarily need to be words. It can also be appreciative of their efforts. This is one of the things that, you know, sometimes, sometimes people just, don't hit the mark, but they're not given credit for the attempt. And this is again about being appreciative. When we, when you make a request of your partner, and maybe they're not perfect at it yet, but you see the effort. You want to let them know because, again, if we don't get, if you don't get credit, if you don't get acknowledgement for the effort you're putting in, then the attitude is. Well, why should I do this? And so this is a this is an incredible, incredibly um, damaging thing. So one of the ways that you can bring more appreciation into your marriage is to identify the ways that both you and your partner contribute to the marriage. This conclude, includes financial, emotional chores, childcare, meal prep, all of that. And then you know just simply thanking them every single day for one thing that they've done that, that you appreciate. Um, and also pay attention to the ways that they show their appreciation for you. Okay? So moving on to number seven is to ask. Okay? So going back to John Gottman and his four horsemen, one of the horsemen is um, complaining. And complaining, again, that goes with the negative. I'm not getting what I want, and so I'm just going to complain. When a better solution is to ask. Now, I mean, I, I have this very vivid recollection of many years ago, I was hiking with my mom in the Colorado mountains, and thank goodness I was behind her, because her statement was that she didn't think that women, that women should have to ask for what they wanted. Luckily, as I said, I was behind her, so she did not see my jaw literally hit the ground. Because what that does, it, is it expects your partner to be a mind reader, and they are going to fail. Because your partner cannot get into your mind. Now, I'm not talking about something that you've asked for 20 times. In that particular case, yes, your partner needs to be paying attention. But I'm talking about, again, those unspoken expectations. We have these expectations. We have this idea, if my partner loved me, they would just know. Oh my gosh, we do not have the mind reading school of marriage. You need to ask. And because unhappiness in a relationship is often driven by resentment, and resentment is caused by not getting your needs met. And if you're not getting your needs met, then have you been asking? Have you been putting it in language that your partner can truly, truly understand? Um, and, and again, this is really challenging. It's easy to make a complaint. It's easy to focus on the things that you don't like. But when you flip that and put it into a request, could we please do this? First, it gives your partner clarity about what it is you want. It also gives you a place to start negotiating 
towards getting what you want and nobody is having to play guessing games okay and going back to Terry real he has a great approach to this he his viewpoint is to say to your partner how can I help you give me what I need so you've made the request and you're, what you want to do is you want to set your partner up for success, right? Because you're the one with the scorecard. You're the one whose need it is. You're the one who wants this thing. So the best way to do it is to help your partner give it to you, right? Okay, moving on to number eight. Hmm, here's one that we always love, to be intimate. And when people hear the word intimacy, they almost always think sex. And yes, sex is part of intimacy, but it's not the only part. True intimacy in a relationship encompasses the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And being intimate in all of these areas usually sets you, sets you up for an amazing sex life. Now, that's not always the case, but usually if you're, if you're intimate on all these other levels, that's going on too and here's what makes real intimacy difficult real intimacy is the willingness to be vulnerable to share with your partner all aspects of yourself um, you know, when, when you're emotionally intimate, you're sharing your, your, your feelings with your partners, your positive feelings, your not so positive feelings. When you're intellectually or mentally intimate with your partner, you're sharing your thoughts about things, right? Now, this goes back <laughs> to the being kind and being present and, you know, where people can really share these things because it has to be safe if you don't feel like you can share your true thoughts and feelings with your partner you cannot be intimate with them yes you can go through the physical um, experience of sex but you're not making love you're not connecting on that deep level that's really why most people get married in the first place. They want to have this deeper connection. Um, you know, and, and again, physical intimacy isn't just sex. It's also the non-sexual things, the holding of the hands, the hugging, the kiss goodbye when you leave each other in the morning, the kiss when you come back in the evening. Um, these are these, the, the non-sexual physical interactions which human beings um, thrive and, and require physical touch. This is what's made the pandemic so difficult. When we had to stay away from people, we, you know, just, just holding somebody's hand is, is comforting. And you, know, and you can share that intimacy with people. And, and, you know, and sometimes the actual act of sex can get in the way because of intimacy because people are into their own pleasure and they're not really connecting with the other person and sometimes that's fine I mean you know it's great but it's not the intimacy that we're looking at what we're, what we're talking about this is the kind of intimacy we're talking about is that you when people talk about their soulmate um, it's the ability for you to be yourself in a safe and supportive relationship it's about being connected on a deeper level um, that's what this is all about and you know like I said little things like you know, kissing each other goodbye in the morning sharing your thoughts about an experience at work or an article you read or you know something you saw on in the movies and sharing your feelings about what made you excited that day or what hurt you these are the things that let you connect on a deeper level with each other okay the next thing that's a critical component and that every couple I think every human being on the planet actually um, can do a better job on is listening 
one of the most common complaints that I hear from my clients is that they don't communicate. Well, the truth of the matter is we are always communicating. What the problem is is we don't like either what's being communicated from the other person or how our partner is responding to what we're communicating to them. And you know, the idea of communication, talking and listening, we talk, you know, there's that very famous expression is that we have two ears and one mouth, which means we should be doing more listening than we are doing talking. But listening to understand not listening to contradict, right? A lot of times when we're listening to our partners, we're listening up to the point where they say something that we don't like and now we've already planned our response to it. That's not listening. Real listening is when you can describe your partner's thoughts, feelings, beliefs, position to a third person and you get it right. That doesn't mean you agree with it. It means that you understand it. Um, there's, a, there's a quote, and I apologize. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think who said it. But the quote is, listening is as close, no, being heard is as close to feeling loved that for some people there is no difference. So we all want to be heard. We all want to be seen. We all want to be validated. That requires being heard, being listened to, right? And I can pretty much guarantee that if you think about the last conversation that you and your partner had that didn't go well, somewhere I'm going to pretty much guarantee that there was a breakdown in the listening component of it. So, you know, and, and the harder and more personal the topic, the harder it is to listen without becoming defensive. But it's a skill that can be taught, that can be learned, and I highly recommend it that, you know, you become a master of it. And then the last one, and this is a really important one, is to forgive. This goes along with the saying, to err is human, to forgive divine. Now, I need to be very clear that when you forgive somebody, it does not mean that what they did was okay. It just means that you recognize that there was no ill intent involved and that, you know, you're not going to let it sit and fester and become resentment. Um, it's a gift that everybody has the capacity to give if you want to. But the hurt, anger, and resentment that you feel often gets in the way. And, you know, it really isn't that. And there's there's another obstacle to forgiveness is the confusion between forgiving and forgetting. Just because you've forgiven your partner or your partner's forgiven you, it doesn't mean it's not the same as if it never happened. Forgiveness is a process. It's not a one-time action. Um, you may need, to, you know, you may need time to forgive or you may need, you know, it can happen in stages, especially if, if it's been something seriously damaging, but I'm going to tell you, even something as damaging as infidelity can be forgiven. I've had the honor of helping people through that horrible, horrible thing. And, you know, forgiveness is, is important. Now, I'm not telling people to forgive if the behavior just keeps happening over and over again, because that's, that's not you know, because then somebody's really not sorry about it. Um, but another way, another form of forgiveness, which I think is critically important, is to give your partner the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, if you have, if, if, if they do something that is hurtful or annoying or whatever, um, try to think about all the possible reasons why your partner did this. One of the biggest reasons is because they didn't know it was going to hurt you. 
<laughs> um, and you know, and and so if it does, then that just needs to be shared. But but don't jump to the conclusion that they're that they're doing it automatically to hurt you, because then that's the way you're going to approach it. Um, because there's, I had a client many many years ago that I asked her what would be you know, a, a sign that, you know, that we were done working together that she'd accomplished her goals. And she told me that, well, it, her husband would never hurt her again. And I went, okay, well, we're never going to get there because he could not hurt her on purpose. I mean, that's, that, we all have that capacity, but we don't know always what our actions the impact that our actions are going to have. Something that wouldn't bother us, wouldn't bother me, bothers you. And so in, until I do that and find that out, I don't know that it's a problem. But it didn't mean that I intended to cause harm. Um, and, and, you know, a corollary, which I don't have time to go into today, is about the, the importance of a good apology to the process of forgiveness, um, because that can be a very, very critical component. So um, what I'd like you to do is to take a moment and identify one of these areas that you would really like to focus on, the one that you think might help your marriage the best. Now, again, they're all very helpful, and I encourage you to go back and listen to the show again. Um, take some notes because, you know, a, a good marriage is possible if you know what works, and that's the purpose of this show, and I hope that you found today's show helpful, and until next week, stay loving. <laughs>